So today I want to talk about um, two things, which are two different intersecting systems. Um, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday. One is this huge system of science. The other one is this system of law. And I, I call this the legal admissibility matrix, mostly because it sounds cool. That's truly the only reason. I couldn't think of what else to call it other than it intersects on multiple levels. It's not just one intersection, it's multiple levels of intersection and multiple levels of complexity in this area. And we've had two cases this year, or in, in 2010 actually, about a year and a year and a half ago, on this subject, whether or not lie detection should be admissible. So what I'd like to do is explain um, a little bit about the science and some of the problems uh, that we still have with the science. And then I want to explain more of my talk is focused on the law because I really am just a lawyer and a law professor and I, I don't uh, pretend to be a neuroscientist, although I'd, I'd like to because it would be very cool to pretend to be one. But nonetheless, I'm a lawyer and that's what I focus on. So let me, and I have a little video I want to show to you about neuroscience lie detection from PBS. That's pretty cool. So. There's, there's multiple sort of modalities um, in which people are trying to use neuroscience to detect uh, deception. The first of which is the fMRI, which is the one I'm actually going to focus on, mostly because it's more interesting. Um, and there's a lot of competing labs doing work in this area. There's not that many people doing the event-related potential work on lie detection. There's really one big lab at Northwestern doing most of it. And while it's very good, it's, you, know, you want to see other labs doing it because you see lots of interesting findings with uh, replication and competition within the science. And also, fMRI poses a whole added layer of complexity, which is the visual piece. It's really beautiful. And in case you, you were looking at that brain, weren't you, when it was first up there? Because we're humans, and we love to look at brains. We are fascinated with brains. And when we were at neuroscience boot camp, you know, all the neuroscientists are so proud because they study the organ that studies the other organs. And they would tell us that repeatedly like it was a badge of courage. But the f fact of the matter is we are really fascinated. Humans are fascinated with our own brains. So I think of these two systems, the scientific system and then the, the legal system as having, you know, they, they kind of, they're orthogonal and then they intersect. And so they intersect at multiple places. And so I've created what I think encompasses the matrix. And I want to give you this sort of overview of what it is and, and where these points of intersection are. And then I want to kind of deconstruct this a bit and talk about the science first and then the law. So the first thing is we want to put, if we put neuroscience evidence of lie detection into a case before a jury, um, it has to come in as expert evidence. So first we have expert evidence, which has myriad requirements. Um, and it's about a judicially disfavored subject, which is credibility. A lot of you are familiar with the fact that uh, polygraph, for example, is largely inadmissible uh, in the United States. It, it doesn't have yet, the, the neuroscience doesn't have what's called uh, ecological validity, but a lot of you know that because you study neuroscience, right? Um, lawyers don't quite get this. They say, but you've got all these nice lab tests and they all seem to be consistent and they don't understand that there's a lot of real-world problems that haven't really been addressed. Um, and, and it poses, as we say in the law, black box problems, which is um, black boxes you can't see into. And the jury, or a judge, quite frankly, um, cannot get to the methodology of how you create an fMRI picture, okay? Because it's way too complex for most of us to deconstruct. Um, in fact, Laura and I were just talking about that yesterday, about how complicated the actual process of creating an fMRI scan is and, and, and you know humans create the scan the brain doesn't really look like that so it's about a subject people find particularly interesting and therefore it's more salient to them in a courtroom than other forms of evidence um, and it uses a term or a concept that may be overly influential to juries there's been a couple of studies done that if you tell a jury um, you, you, pre you present expert evidence to a jury about psychology, say, for example, that they react one way. If you tell them it's neuropsychology, um, they, they 
they pay far more, they're, it's more salient. They're, they pay more attention and they think it's more serious uh, than just psychology, which they can dismiss, but not neuropsychology. So that's one of the problems is just the whole word is, is even really impressive. I mean, I know those of you who are in the cognitive science you probably like telling people you're a neuroscientist, right? It sounds so much cooler than just a scientist. And uh, juries react the same way. Um, and it, it offers visual data that may be overly impressive to juries, which is three-dimensional, vividly colored brain images. And that carries a lot more weight than a scientist standing up here and telling you what his or her results were um, of a scan. It's those three-dimensional moving pictures are really impressive. Um, and it poses potential constitutional implications. Uh, Fourth Amendment rights to be free from unreasonable search and seizure until the Supreme Court does away with that. Um, but we still have that amendment and we still have a right to, to be free from that. And then the Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate oneself. So if we think about sort of forced extraction of information in the brain, you can see that there's potential Fifth Amendment problems too. So that's the admissibility matrix in a whole. And now I, I want to go through some of these um, in a little more depth and kind of unpack them a bit. So the science. Um, and let's start with that. And I want to show you this. Um, this is a little video from Wired Science. Um, it's done, it's, it, it was done in part with No Lie MRI, which is a commercial company. And one of the people who discovered the first neural correlates of deception, Daniel Langleben at Penn, uh, who, I'm, who I've written a couple of articles with. And he used this, this paradigm of holding up a playing card. You know, people had to look at playing cards. They'd given a little stack of them. And they had to either lie or tell the truth about whether the playing card on the screen matched the one in their hand, OK? And so that's what this is about. But it gives you a good idea, it gives you kind of a little overview of what this really, what these tests look like. So here's the, the Tesla 3 scanner. This is. Um, a typical scanner that would be used for MRI, fMRI research. Um, and vastly simplified. And, and again, I, I don't want to uh, pretend I can explain this in the kind of detail a real neuroscientist could. But what we have is, what we're really looking for is what parts of the brain are using oxygen. That's really what we're doing, right? Because oxygen use is correlated with activity. Um, the, analysis the analysis provides a comparison between the more activated areas and the less activated areas, what's called in the science cognitive uh, subtraction. Um, and, and one of the important things to remember, and neuroscientists tell me this all the time, is that you have to have two areas of the brain to compare, um, and that that's critical for getting a proper scan. The interesting thing, of course, is that the neuroscientists have to identify which areas they want to look at. So I always want to ask the question, well, what's going on in all these other areas that you're not looking at? And so what you don't look at may be just as important as what you look at, and that's one of the complexities of this. Um, this is a visual representation of one set of data of 22 individuals. Um, and you can see you know, that they've colored for you the different pieces of the brain that are, light, that, um, that are activated. Uh, when they told a lie during this playing card test and when they were telling the truth. And there does seem to be um, a fairly noticeable, right? This seems to be a fairly noticeable difference. Now, one of the things you have to remember, of course, is this is a combination of physics, biology, chemistry, um, and a really complicated statistics, including Gaussian smoothing. Um, and, and what they really do is they look at the most activated voxels in the brain, which are kind of like three-dimensional pixels. And, um, and, and from that, they start, to, they, they start to see which areas of the brain are getting the most activation. One of the things they do with, these, with the first many, many sets of lie detection uh, studies was they, they had group averages. They could not tell you anything about a particular brain. And you think, well, that makes sense, except you know, they only had, for example, in this one, 22 subjects. And apparently, that was enough for statistical significance. I'm not a statistician, but they say this was. 
Um, but if you think about it, um, one of the problems with this is they said any one of the people scanned may brain probably didn't look like this. So we had a lot of variability among the brains. And so if you think about it in, term, in, in like a term that in a way I can understand, I think about it as sort of Kobe Bryant and me put together from the average height male, right? And yet neither one of us would fit in that average height uh, sort of little voxel, right? We're, we're both way outside. We're both, you know, outliers. And so we don't really know, like, how good is an average, the averaging of the scan? Is that appropriate for use in evidence? And there's been a lot of concern about that. In the last few years, they've been starting to do um, more studies that can actually get individual data. And of course, that's a critical step in making this useful uh, as a lie detection concept. So uh, one of the good things is we have several teams of scientists uh, around the world. Um, and there's, at last time I checked, there was about 30 studies. Um, but you know, they're going on all the time. Um, although I hear the funding sort of drying up. So this, this, we may not be getting a lot more right away. Um, most studies draw conclusions from the group. Only a few have moved into the individual data. Um, researchers conclude there are neural correlates of deception that can be detected. And we have, you know, all these studies are fairly consistent. There is a fair amount of overlap um, in the areas. And so we can really start to say which brain systems are implicated in telling a lie. But again, the word nascent, I think, is really important to remember. This is really new stuff. And, uh, it's only been around for about a decade. Except we have one big problem that we have to recognize at first, which is how do we define deception? So I've created, I, I'm a fan of the Buckminster Fuller Dome. And uh, so I created a buckyball of deception for myself. And my husband, who is a big soccer player, says, oh, stop it. It's just a soccer, soccer ball you can see through. And, in fact, I think he's right. It is a soccer ball you can see through. But one of the things I like about it is that there's sort of like planes, you know, for every, for every one side of the plane, there's an opposite plane. And that seems to be true if you think about it, about a deception, right? So we have spontaneous lie versus rehearsed lie. We have lying about something critical versus trivial. You can see these are sort of opposites. And that's why they're going to sort of create this nice kind of sphere of lying. Um, what about lying about physical activity as opposed to a witnessed event? There's, a, there's a, apparently a difference when you lie about something you did. You have this sort of, you know, what, some motor memory in your brain that may be different from just witnessing as a passive witness. Um, what about lying with emotional content? For example, you lie about an upsetting issue. Did you kill your wife on the night of the 14th versus was the playing card an ace of hearts, right? So one's emotionally, emotionally salient, the other one isn't. Um, what about lying about oneself versus others? So is self-referential lying different than lying about somebody else? Um, what about false and real memory confusion, which we know is very real? Um, we see it all the time in the law and in the science. And finally, there's this problem of forgetting, which is a natural a uh, function of uh, a natural brain function, right? The Ebbinghaus curve of forgetting. How does that affect what you remember when you get scanned? So uh, deception itself is an incredibly tricky concept. And of course, you've got to sort of sort out and tease out all these little issues when you're designing the test. So scientists have a number of concerns. Um, these are theirs. Um, I, I tend to agree with them, but only as a lay person. Um, one of, the, one of the big ones is that there's no normative data yet. There's no clinical, there's no big clinical studies yet. We just have these sort of what I call little insight studies. You know, Eureka, the uh, Archimedes jumping from the bathtub yelling Eureka studies, right? Where the, you discover one little tiny thing. But we don't have these big clinical studies that we would have for like a pharmaceutical yet. We just have small studies. Um, so I guess some people would say it's stuck between stage one and stage two of the testing. And, it, and until we keep going, we don't really know more. Um, we have different testing paradigms and non-compatible technology. So not everybody's using the same types of um, Tesla. Some are using three, some are using four. And also, they're not even using the same types of software to analyze the data, and everybody's Statistical analysis is done differently. So it, it's a little bit hard to put these things together. 
Um, we have very young, healthy brains, like the people in this room. Uh, many of you would probably be really good subjects, and then the people writing about it would probably be excluded, right? Because uh, most of the subjects have been under, way under 55, um, most of them. And I, I tend to call them Church of Latter-day Saint brains. They, a lot of the, and I don't mean that as a slur, I mean as a descriptive term. They were non-smoking, non-drinking, non-drug taking. Um, and I thought, wow, how do you find those people? And then I thought, oh yeah, this is how, you know, there's a whole, there's a cohort of people who actually live that way all the time and you don't have to worry about it. So um, there was a lot of tests done on people who had really, really pristine brains, right? And, and how realistic is that for the legal system? I, probably not so much, right? Um, variable results upon replication and insufficient replication, right? So a lot of these small studies we have haven't really been replicated fully by other people. And even when they are, the data don't always match, which is not a huge surprise. Um, do brains behave predictably or uniquely? That's a problem. The other problem is brain um, scans require compliance. I mean, all you have to do is think about something entirely different than you're supposed to, and you've basically ruined the brain scan, right? They can't get anything from you, which is kind of nice for a Fifth Amendment issue, right, in terms of forced confession, but not so good in terms of creating data. So, and finally, countermeasures. Uh, we know countermeasures are effective in polygraph. You know, you put a little tack under your toe and you can make your, uh, uh, all your um, attachments spike, right, uh, as soon as you step on that uh, tack, right? Your, your heart rate jumps, your galvanic skin response jumps. Well, can you do that? Is there some way to do that? And um, Peter um, Rosenfeld and uh, Giorgio Ganes uh, did a really nice study where they found a huge difference with the use of countermeasures that they had designed in an fMRI and EEG study recently. So those are the science concerns. And then we come to the law, um, which has its own set of concerns. The first of which is uh, this taxonomy, as I call it, of legal concerns. So the first concern, and the one I'm going to spend the most time on tonight, is this reliability issue, which is how good, how valid, how reliable, how accurate is the science such that we think it should be admitted into a courtroom in a civil or criminal case. So that's the first concern. The, the next one is that it's about credibility. Do we really want testimony on that? Um, we have jurisprudential concerns, by which I, which I would call it may be too influential for a jury to really adequately handle, and constitutional implications. So if you break down my matrix, it breaks into these four pieces. Um, but the first things first is, is it sufficiently reliable for court? And for reliability, I, I've designed these three kind of models. Um, that I've seen over the years of writing about expert evidence. The first is this sort of polygraph model, which is this inherent skepticism of the science, this discounting of its uh, validity and its reliability, um, and therefore it really never gets to a full-blown analysis. We just think, we don't really like this, we don't think it's very good, we're going to keep it out. Um, and that's pretty much what happened with polygraph in 1923. And that, that continues to be what happens with polygraph. We have that, that very skeptical approach. And that's a possibility for neuroscience lie detection because it's the same subject matter, which is credibility. The second one is the forensic science model, um, which is, an intu in my opinion, and I've written an article about this, I think judges use kind of an intuitive, hunch-like, heuristically-based model, which is, oh, I know about comparing fingerprints, you know? Of course this is good, right? And so they don't really think deeply about it. They sort of react using a heuristic, right? Which is, oh yeah, you compare this, you compare this. You, of course you can tell if they're the same or not. And they don't understand the complexity of what it means to actually declare a match, that that's a scientific and statistical conclusion that you have to draw. And and, and so that's a possibility, but I don't think it's the real possibility because I think this stuff is too complicated. And so I, I think what they're going to use is what I, what I might call the complex science model. And I think DNA evidence provides a really good template for that. Where courts, when DNA evidence was first coming into courts in the early 1990s, 
courts were writing these 20, 30, 40 page opinions, really deconstructing the science, explaining it, explaining why it met the standards, what we call the sort of Daubert trilogy standards, um, it, w which are really science based, and we'll get to those in a little bit. And they use this complex science model. So I think we're likely to see either the polygraph model, which is courts just say, oh no, we don't like this, it's about credibility, keep it out. And I think we might have seen that in one case. And then we have this, the complex science model, which we've seen in another case. And I think, one, I think that's the better route, but two, I think it's the more um, apt route for this type of evidence. So the complex science model is um, an in-depth science-based analysis, or quasi-science-based analysis, as much as lawyers can actually do, um, using what, what some people would call a rational processing model, which is kind of a step-by-step -step analysis where they really deconstruct everything into small pieces and talk about it individually. Um, and they consider factors, they, they weigh the evidence by using factors more closely aligned with research science, which is replication, is one of them. Um, peer evaluation and publication, error rates, what are the, what are the error rates for these um, studies that have been done so far? Are there standards controlling the methodology? And um, general scientific agreement with principles, methodology, and conclusion. And so I think this method, which is what we call sort of the Daubert standard for those of you who are who know anything about sort of legal evidence, um, we'd call this the Daubert methodology, is probably the likely one and probably the appropriate one in my opinion. Um, and the real problem, in my opinion, uh, that we come to, and I think this is often the problem with scientific evidence, is the ipsy-dixit problem, if you will. My friend Michael Sachs has used that with respect to forensic science. And what it means is whether there's too great an analytic gap between the data generated and the opinion proffered. So let's assume we have about 30 studies showing a, a fairly high correlation um, in which between 75 and 90 percent accuracy, they believe they can tell whether in a given controlled study a subject, an individual subject, is telling the truth or lying about a playing card or something else, right? Um, is that good enough to go to court and say, is the defendant lying in response to this question in this case? Okay, and so that ipsy dixit problem, that sort of inferential leap, I think is what the real stopping block is for this to be evident yet. In terms of reliability, I think there's other concerns, but, um, and, and, and we're not there yet, okay? That we're just, that we're not ready for that yet. So there was two court cases um, that came up in the last year and a half. And uh, one is Wilson uh, versus Core Staff, which was an employment discrimination case. And the other one is U.S. versus SEMRA, which is a, um, a fraud case in federal court in which a Medicaid fraud, in which a doctor was accused of committing Medicaid fraud. And he said he never intended to do it, that the paperwork was so incredibly complicated that he didn't realize he was committing $700 million worth of fraud. Um, it could happen, okay? Um, and the other one in Wilson versus Core Staff was they wanted to show, the, the plaintiffs wanted to prove that one of the witnesses was in fact being truthful when he gave testimony about this, uh, this employment discrimination dispute that was going on with one of the coworkers. Um, Wilson versus Core Staff used what I would call more of the polygraph model to keep the evidence out. It said, first of all, it's, it's, not, it's about credibility. We don't like credibility evidence. The jury is, is the arbiter of credibility. They don't need expert testimony. And then kind of as an afterthought, they said, and this is not generally accepted in the science yet, and it's too persuasive, you know, without being sufficiently probative. And, and so it was a very short opinion. It was a trial court opinion. It's a reported opinion, but it's not, it just doesn't have a lot of traction. It's a very thin, thin opinion in my, in, it's a thin opinion in my opinion. Um, U.S. versus SEMRAB, on the other hand, is completely different. It uses the complex uh, processing model that I talked about, the complex science model. It is a, an in-depth analysis of the science, the experts, the testimony. It's about a 30-some page opinion. Um, and it's very good. 
It really tears apart the science. It really explains what the shortcomings are in terms of, uh, the, of the science being evidence and explains why it doesn't meet this standard of reliability that we use in the courts for, in federal courts at least. But they all, they all agree on this, that um, they both disallow it on the sort of standard of reliability or the admissibility standard. They both focus on the fact that this is expert testimony about credibility which is disfavored. And Semro is concerned about the ecological validity which is, okay, fine, you can do it in the lab, but that doesn't mean you can tell us if Dr. Semra was lying or not. Um, and the potential for unfair prejudice, that the jury's gonna be overwhelmed by this stuff. Um, Nancy Conwisher from Harvard, who's a neuroscientist of some repute apparently, um, she's quoted in there and she's quite clear. She just says, uh, nothing with anything remotely resembling real world situations. Um, I'm not sure that's entirely true, I think the paradigm, um, paradigms that, that researchers are using now are getting much closer to real world situations. People are told to you know, steal something uh, from the lab and then lie about it. And then they're debriefed later and told. So I think we are getting closer to real world situations. But of course, you know, if you're gonna get paid for getting right answers as opposed to going to jail for getting wrong answers, you know, th there's just this huge gap between the laboratory, again, and uh, the courtroom. Now, this isn't really fatal. If you think about eyewitness identification expert testimony, which we now let in a lot, um, that was all created in labs across the country. But what we had was we had about 40 years of data being generated by competing labs and a lot of consistency in results. And so, there, and they were doing things that were, that were more ecologically valid in terms of the translational uh, value. So, so the question I raise, I guess, and, and what I'm writing about is this, what I call the legal toolbox. Do, do we have the tools to manage the science, right? Is the science good enough for the courtroom? Is the courtroom capable of managing the science? And, so there's two ways of looking at this. We can regulate neuroscience lie detection externally, right? We can just, um, Hank Greeley, Judy Isles have proposed that we, we have this sort of ban on the use of neuroscience lie detection for anything other than research. It cannot be used anywhere. Um, or maybe there's some other ways to externally regulate it, but I think external regulation is called for only if it's really qualitatively different than other forms of expert testimony. And so if it is, um, that's one way of doing it, or we can regulate it using the federal rules of evidence or correlative state rules. And so like there's a military rule of evidence um, that forbids polygraphs from being used, but there's no correlative federal or state law that says that. Um, it's just a per se exclusion. So we could have a per se exclusion created, um, there's this group of sexual history evidence rules that were created by Congress. Uh, they sort of short-circuited the normal rulemaking process of the court so that prior um, sexual crimes could be admissible without much of anything else, even if they're 30 years old. Um, and so maybe we could have a new federal rule for neuroscience detection evidence. But I, I think, I, I really don't think this is so qualitatively different that we need that. I, I think the standard judicial regulation, maybe with science panels, might be enough at the moment. And so we could regulate it on a case-by-case -case basis using our standard sort of guides that we use, which are the federal rules of evidence or state rules of evidence. The Daubert Trilogy, which is kind of that complex science model I showed you earlier. And then guidance from the advisory committee notes to the rules, which talk about Maybe there's a difference between science that's been created in the lab for the purpose of science and science that's been created for purposes of litigation um, because that's gonna come up here. And then finally, what I call input from maybe science panels. And these science panels are, what they do is the court uh, finds out like who are probably the best scientists in the country or some of the best dealing with this subject and they bring them in <coughs> and they have them hear the evidence uh, that's gonna be presented in court and they make a recommendation to the court basically 
about whether there is or is not good data supporting this and whether it, whether it makes sense to admit it or exclude it. So in the breast implant litigation, they used a science panel, and that pretty much ended the breast implant litigation, where people thought that breast implants were causing connective tissue disease. The science panel looked at all the science submitted and said there's no causation here at all. It's, it's far less than a relative risk ratio of greater than two. There's not causation. And, and, and the court relied on that. And it was really a useful way of design, deciding an issue that was uh, important to large groups of, of litigants. And they did it using, like, with the help of scientists. Um, so the other way is, is maybe we could just have limited admissibility at some point of this, um, admitted as probabilistic evidence. So for example, if it's between 75 and 90% accurate, the jury could be told that, you know, where, where the jury deals with things like this is one out of a billion chance that the defendant did not contribute this DNA. I think they could, a jury could work with these statistics and, and use them in a way like social framework evidence, like we do with eyewitnesses, for example. So the jury could be instructed that this isn't proof that he's lying or not lying. It's just some evidence for you to consider whether you think he's credible. It's just some evidence. And that's what we always say. A brick does not have to be a wall. You don't have to hit a home run with every piece of evidence. It's simply one more piece of evidence you add to the mix. So these would be two ways of sort of regulating the use of this evidence. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. I, I think we're far from there. Um, Lang Levin, who you saw on the, uh, on the video, um, he thinks, look, th this range means we need more extensive testing. That's what this indicates. It doesn't mean it's ready for courtroom evidence. Uh, Giorgio Ghana says we need more research before we know whether this is going to be accurate in the real world. Now, these are probably two of the leading scientists in the world on this subject, certainly two of the leading scientists in the United States. And, and then here's the, here's the two comments from the commercial entities which licensed the work. Um, Huizinga, who you saw from No Lie MRI, he was in the video too, um, he says, you know, they conclude it works, all the studies. Cases will come, they just have to come to the right venue, meaning all we need is the right judge to let this in, okay? And then Stephen Lakin, who testified in both of the courtroom cases, um, and who is, by the way, a, a very good scientist in other areas, um, he says, uh, we're between 78 and 97% accurate. I think that's inflated a bit, but um, so long as you tell that to a jury, it can still be considered evidence. Um, not really, Dr. Lakin. I hate to tell you, but you need to go back to law school. That's not true. It doesn't mean it's evidence. Uh, it means you've got a fairly substantial error rate is what it means, and it may not be evidence. Um, and finally, we have this, this nice little piece from the advisory committee notes to the evidence rules. Have they developed their opinions expressly for purposes of testifying? And of course, when you look at these two guys, right, and you think, wow, that's exactly what they're doing is they're trying to commercialize this product. So in fact, if you notice how different their comments are from the researchers, I think it's really I important. Um, Langman and I wrote this article, re, you know, arguing recently as a request for this sort of public funding for large-scale clinical trials. Uh, we're going to continue to try to figure out when people are lying. Uh, as it turns out, we're all very good liars. Um, it's, it's an adaptive trait, and we do it well. And we're all really bad at determining when other people are lying except maybe for your mother, who always knew. But short of that, I mean, we're just not good lie detectors, and so we're always looking for lie detection. And I mean, there's, you know, there's a multi-thousand year history of trying to get at the truth when people are telling lies. You know, this, this quest isn't going to stop, and, and we can say we're not gonna have anything to do with this lie detection, but it, people are gonna keep doing it because we're fascinated with it. So um, somebody else, another fellow, John Dylan uh, Haynes in England, thinks 10 to 20 years before we have a, a lie detector. So what now? Um, I think use the tools at hand. Uh, focus on this question of ecological validity, which I don't think we can clearly meet yet. Follow the DNA model in the courts. Pay close attention to this inferential leap. And that give the scientists time to keep working on this to see what we come up with. 
And then what we have to do is we have to think about the other issues, right? And so one big question is, is expert testimony on credibility desirable? Do we really want people? I mean, let's assume we get really good at this, right? Or no, the we, royal we. I mean they, the neuroscientists, right? What if they get really good at this? What if we have like the post-cogs? Remember that Minority Report movie with the pre-cogs? Well, what about the post-cogs? You know, they get it right all the time. Um, do we want to think that our brains are invadable because now we can do it so well? Is that the only thing? Is reliability the only concern? And I think there's something very frightening about that um, to all of us. And also, it, this essential human privacy and dignity piece that we have to really spend some time thinking about before we decide whether we want this to be evidence. Um, also, how are these going to affect juries? I mean, these are computer animated, recreated pictures of statistical mapping, right? I mean, can juries handle this, you know? You want the truth? You can't handle the truth, right? Um, we don't know yet if they can. Um, we do know that we've had a lot of computer generated evidence and expert testimony in the last few years, you know, rollovers, car accidents, um, shootings, you know, and, and juries seem to be able to handle it, but um, I, we haven't done a lot of research on the juries themselves yet to find out whether or not this is too influential. Um, there are a couple studies showing that these, these um, they call it the Christmas tree effect, that, it's, that this stuff is too influential and juries get totally mesmerized by it. Um, but there's been some critiques of those studies, too, like everything else. So, and then finally, our Fourth Amendment and our Fifth Amendment concerns have to be taken into account. So you can see this is enormously complex from a legal perspective, from a neuroethics perspective, and from a science perspective. Um, and you know, maybe in the fullness of time, we'll get to all of these. But one big thing lurking on the horizon, which is penalty phase hearings. So um, in, in death penalty cases, which we have a lot of in the United States, the trial is bifurcated into a guilt phase. And if you're not guilty, then you go home. If you're guilty, you stay, and there's a penalty phase hearing. And during that penalty phase hearing, the defendant is entitled to put on pretty much anything in mitigation, okay, to mitigate that he, for example, he, he did not have the hardness of heart that the prosecutor suggests, anything to make him look less uh, morally culpable as opposed to legally culpable. And one of the things we've seen recently is in the Dugan case, the court allowed the, the defendant to put on fMRI evidence, it was the first fMRI case admitting this, um, to show that the defendant suffered from psychopathy. Um, and that it wasn't that he was really a bad guy, he had a brain that worked differently from everybody else. Now, I'm not sure putting fMRI on evidence to show you're a psychopath is really going to encourage the jury to be lenient, and in fact, they, they didn't. They gave him the death penalty. But there were critiques about the science in that case, and yet it still came in. And one of the reasons is that, one, the defendant has this constitutional right to put on mitigating evidence, and two, a lot of the evidence rules don't really apply at this phase. They only apply in the guilt phase. So um, we have a, a, a greatly reduced standard of uh, admissibility, and, and we have a constitutional door opening to a lot of evidence. Um, so I guess the question is, is this the sort of crack in the door that fMRI lie detection is going to come in to, to show for some purpose of mitigation? Um, for example, when the defendant said, I, I really don't remember how this murder happened, and you put on evidence to show he's telling the truth uh, because he was so impaired by drugs or alcohol, for example, and you put on a, an fMRI to show he's between 75 and 90 percent likely to be telling the truth, you can see how this could be a wedge to open the courthouse door. And of course, once it's in that way, there's a much greater likelihood it's going to start coming in in other ways. And so I, I do think we really have to sort of address these issues and, and not say it's just not ready. I think there's a really good chance this is the way it's going to come in for the first time. Um, so I want to thank you for listening to this and uh, for being such an attentive audience. And I'd love to take questions. Thank you.